Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Nicholas Cruz? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. It's important to note in this case that Nicholas Cruz has been accused of the 2018 shooting in Parkland, Florida, but at the time of making this video, he has not been tried. I'll start with the background in this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Nicholas Cruz was born in Margate, Florida on September 24, 1998. He was adopted by Linda and Roger Cruz. Roger Cruz would die in August of 2004. Cruz has an extensive history of behavioral problems, which I will cover in the analysis. Cruz worked at a dollar store and was enrolled in a program to earn his GED. On February 11, 2017, he bought an AR-15 rifle from a gun store in Coral Springs, Florida. On November 1, 2017, Linda Cruz died from pneumonia. After this, Nicholas Cruz lived with friends and relatives. Now let's hear a word from the sponsor for today's video, ExpressVPN. Recently, more than 100 Twitter accounts were hacked. Passwords, email addresses, phone numbers, and more, all taken from high-profile people like Joe Biden, Elon Musk, and Kanye West. These kind of attacks are getting more frequent and more severe. It's not just Twitter. We see it with Facebook, eBay, Uber, Adobe, and Yahoo. If someone can hack high-profile figures, no one is safe. That's why I use ExpressVPN to safeguard my personal data online. ExpressVPN is an app that funnels your data through a secure encrypted tunnel so that no matter what type of device you use, you can have peace of mind every time you use the internet. The app connects with just one click, it is lightning fast, and the best part is that ExpressVPN works on up to five devices simultaneously so you and your whole family can stay protected. Protect yourself with ExpressVPN, the VPN rated number one by CNET, Wired, and countless others. Find out how you can get three months of ExpressVPN for free by visiting expressvpn.com slash drgrande or clicking the link in the description box below. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On February 14, 2018, Cruz was recognized by a staff member at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. He was walking toward Building 12, carrying a rifle case and a backpack. Building 12 was a three-story structure. It was occupied by about 900 students and 30 teachers. Using an AR-15 rifle, he started shooting at students and teachers, striking and killing several people before he dropped his rifle and exited the building. The shooting lasted about six minutes. 14 students and three staff members were killed. 17 people were wounded. There was an armed and uniformed police officer named Scott Peterson on the scene during the shooting. He did nothing to stop Cruz. I have a separate video about Scott Peterson. Cruz was arrested about two miles from the school. He was charged with murder. According to the police, Cruz confessed to the shooting. He would later be indicted on 17 counts of first-degree murder and 17 counts of attempted first-degree murder. It was reported that Cruz's attorney offered to have Cruz plead guilty in exchange for no death penalty, but the prosecution declined the offer. Now moving to my analysis. As I mentioned, Cruz was adopted. His birth mother was named Brenda Woodward. She had an extensive criminal history, 28 arrests. Here are just a few examples. There were charges for car theft, possessing weapons, burglary, domestic violence, drugs, she allegedly beat a companion with a tire iron and allegedly threatened to burn down a friend's house. At the time Cruz was born, Woodward was addicted to crack cocaine and drank alcohol. Cruz's older half-sister, Danielle Woodward, was sentenced to eight years in prison for second-degree attempted murder of a police officer. She also had a long criminal history prior to that. She was arrested 17 times. Two of those offenses were for carrying a firearm into a school. Cruz's adoptive mother, Linda Cruz, had no criminal history. She was frustrated by Cruz's inappropriate, disruptive, and dangerous behavior. She thought by indulging him, 
his mood would improve. This included giving him access to weapons and violent video games. Nicholas Cruz had a number of behavioral problems that started at an early age. These problems would be evident at home, in school, and in the community. From 2008 to 2018, at least 45 calls were made to law enforcement that directly or indirectly referred to Nicholas Cruz. A few examples. One call indicated that he was a school shooter in the making. On the day that Linda Cruz died, her cousin called the police and advised them to take away Cruz's firearms. A call came in to the FBI about five weeks before the shooting that indicated Cruz might conduct a school shooting. At home, his family had to deal with a lot of challenging behaviors. For example, Cruz tortured animals. He once shot a neighbor's chicken with a pellet gun. He pointed a gun at his half-brother when they argued over food. He pointed an AR-15 rifle at his mother's head, telling her that he would blow her brains out. He consumed quite a bit of marijuana and Xanax. Linda Cruz repeatedly called the police about Cruz's angry and aggressive behavior. She was hoping the police could talk to him and convince him to modify that behavior. At school, Cruz's behavior was no better. He threatened students. He was a number of fights. He was abusive to his girlfriend. He made online posts about conducting a shooting at a school. Cruz appeared to maintain a number of views associated with extremism, including views that were anti-Semitic, racist, homophobic, and xenophobic. He posted pictures of himself with a number of different types of weapons, including firearms, air rifles, and edged weapons, like knives. He made posts suggesting he wanted to kill a lot of people. He wanted to carry out a shooting similar to the University of Texas Tower shooting. School officials tried to deal with Cruz's behavioral problems in a number of ways, including transferring Cruz to new schools several times. He was transferred six times in one three-year period. In 2014, about four years before the shooting, he was transferred to a school specializing in students who have learning disabilities and emotional problems. In January of 2016, he was transferred to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. In 2017, he was kicked out of the high school for committing an assault. He had a number of other offenses he had accrued as well. The staff recognized that he may be a danger to the students there. They went so far as to restrict him from wearing a backpack at the school. Over the course of several years, many different mental health professionals recommended various levels of intervention to help Cruz, including involuntary treatment at a residential facility. The Florida Department of Children and Families conducted an investigation at one point when Cruz made disturbing online posts, said he was going to buy a gun, and had cut both his arms. Around the same time, we see a school resource officer said that Cruz should have an involuntary mental health assessment. Cruz received mental health treatment at various times, although he did not receive any care in the year prior to the shooting. It has been reported that Cruz was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, depression, and autism spectrum disorder. One assessment indicated that Cruz was at a low risk to harm himself or others. After his arrest, Cruz said that he had been depressed for some time. He had feelings of loneliness and solitude. He didn't have a lot of friends. He talked about his drug use. He would say that marijuana calmed the demon in his head who told him to do bad things. There have been various reports released regarding Cruz's mental health. Here are a few of the observations and statements by mental health clinicians that stood out to me. Cruz had extreme mood lability. So a labile mood means that someone goes back and forth between different extremes. So they can be very sad, then very happy, very calm to very energetic. So this is a difficult symptom to manage in a school setting, of course, because it can be disruptive. We see that Cruz was very irritable and reactive. He was verbally and physically aggressive. He was paranoid. He blamed other people for his behavioral problems, so he tried to escape taking responsibility. He was preoccupied with guns and the military. He destroyed property like his television. We see this instance where he was unhappy with the outcome of a video game and he took out the aggression on the TV. 
He used a hatchet to chop up a tree in the backyard. His adoptive mother was unable to locate that hatchet at one time. We also see another report that said that Cruz had buried a 9mm pistol. So there may have been this pattern of hiding weapons to ensure access to them later on, like he was afraid people would take them away. We see he would punch holes in walls, use sharp tools to cut up upholstery and furniture, and put holes in the walls of the bathroom. He dreamt of killing other people. The mental health professionals believed that Cruz was taking his medication as prescribed. They seemed to have a lot of faith that the medication would control some of the symptoms. Even with all the information that is available about Cruz's mental health, we really don't see what appears to be a quality mental health assessment. There may have been one that was conducted, but it's just not available. So there are a lot of issues that don't seem to be addressed, like potential psychopathy, narcissism. There was talk of a demon by Cruz, so maybe something to do with psychosis. So there's really a lot that needs to be explored. And again, the assessments that are available are really sparse in terms of content. We don't see a lot of digging down deep into what could be going on. A question that frequently comes up in this case is how come Nicholas Cruz wasn't stopped? All these people had seen clear warning signs. Well, some people say that the warning signs were not that clear. I disagree. I think there were nothing but warning signs in this case. Cruz's behavior indicated he was a threat. He flat out said that he had violent fantasies that involved shooting people. I think a lot of people did actually recognize the warning signs. The problem was that nobody took sufficient action to address those signs. Now, that may have been their fault or a problem with the system that they had to follow, like the rules that they were bound by. Nicholas Cruz had negative interactions with every aspect of the system, community, school, mental health treatment professionals, and law enforcement. This case brings attention to how vulnerable that system is, and I think as well how variable treatment quality is in the area of mental health. Even though there are many doctoral-level mental health therapists out there conducting research, the findings from research do not always get applied evenly across all practitioners. Like, some clinicians don't really worry about the research. Many clinicians need more supervision, especially those dealing with people who may be dangerous. Also, the field of mental health does not operate in the realm of certainty, like other disciplines. Mental health clinicians cannot reliably predict dangerous behavior. They are always trying to balance a number of factors. They want to be careful not to sound the alarm too much or too little. Invariably, they are going to incorrectly classify a large number of people. Even with this in mind, I think this is a case where the mental health clinicians clearly made mistakes, not just looking at it in hindsight, but even with the information they had available at the time. I'm not sure Cruz could have given off any more warning signs than he did unless he brought a weapon into the session and said he was planning to use that to kill people. The last part I'll talk about is this connection between the mental health disorders Cruz had and violence. The research literature is pretty clear on this point. Depression and autism spectrum disorder are not connected to violence or serious criminality of any type. ADHD is a little bit different. Individuals with ADHD are at an increased risk to be involved in criminal activity when they move into adulthood. It's not a strong positive association, but there is a connection there. Violent crime is a part of that, but usually not homicide. Rather, we would expect to see crimes like drug offenses, burglary, and robbery. It's also important to remember that correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation, meaning that it could be that people see the crimes and then try to assign a diagnosis of ADHD. In that sense, crime could cause ADHD diagnoses. It could also be that whatever facilitates criminality also contributes to ADHD, like there's something out there, another factor, that causes both of them, and we don't know what it is. Cruz appeared to have a lack of empathy, a lot of anger, aggression, and he was impulsive. Some have suggested that his behavior aligns with psychopathy and narcissism, which are not mental disorders, but rather a group of traits. Not all horrible behaviors can be explained by mental disorders. Rather, we see a combination of personality characteristics, genetics, and the environment 
can simply come together in a way that's destructive. Maybe that is the problem with the system. It tends to fail when people cannot be easily categorized. Maybe every discipline involved in this case was simply pushing Cruz to another area, like law enforcement was telling his adoptive mother to figure it out. The school was telling mental health professionals to solve the problem. The mental health clinicians were putting it back on the school and law enforcement. Maybe everybody was pointing the finger at somebody else and saying, you need to come up with a solution. Cruz doesn't fit anywhere in our discipline. Perhaps there needs to be better coordination between different types of services and institutions instead of a loose assembly of communications that may or may not be respected or understood. Those are my thoughts on the case of Nicholas Cruz. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.